Why would Jesus call a terrible individual to serve him? Today on The Midweek Move, we're going to talk about that. Hello, welcome to The Midweek Move, podcast extension of The Healing Place, the podcast where we examine the scriptures line by line, verse by verse, and ask ourselves, what is happening today? And ladies and gentlemen, I am joined once again by the man, the myth, the legend, Justice. How you doing, man? Doing good. Glad, glad to have to be you here. I'm glad to have you. Like this has been. Fun. I had a lot of fun with you last week. And, oh, thank you so much. Uh, it was awesome. I, what I really loved about what you did last week uh, with our last episode is, uh, and this is this is a freebie. This is not part of the normal conversation, but as far as the Bible study aspect, because we again we try to teach people not just what the word says, but how yeah. before they can discover it. You didn't just stick with the text in front of us. You brought context from the Old Testament and the New Testament, and we do that a lot of times also with certain topics. But I want to encourage you guys. This is why it's important for you guys to take the whole mm -hmm. context of scriptures when we examine passages, because it helps us to understand. Bringing out that whole aspect about the Son of Man, gold, because that's something that it's not explained right there. Luke's not going, all right, so this is why he said Son of Man. This right. is a contextual thing that you've had to read the Old Testament to understand those things. Right. Yep. And uh, we've said it before, said it every time. If you, if you don't have the context, you'll be conned by the text. Yeah. And we have got to understand these things. And that's the reason why we do this line by line, verse by verse. And sometimes we got to jump ahead <laughs> to understand things, <laughs> yeah. to see the full context of how things play out. So thank you so much, man, for live on the fly demonstrating exactly oh, what we're supposed to do well, there. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, a, a legend you are, sir. And, oh, uh, no, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you missed last week, this is Justice. He's the vice president of academic affairs at Bridges College and Seminary. Mm -hmm. It's a long term. We're going to figure out something else for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like Southwestern, just call it Nelson, uh, but something else. <laughs> but um, over in New Orleans, mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, it's a extremely affordable college yeah. for people to take part. It's completely online. Yep. The, I think last week you said it was $200 for a trimester. For undergraduate degrees. For undergraduate. Yep. That is amazing. Yep. It's and, an amazing deal. Yep. And then master's programs are... Um, five hundred dollars per, per trimester. Five hundred dollars per trimester. That's it. Flat That's rate. That's crazy. So yeah. when's the doctorate program kick in? We are working on one. So pay for us. Yeah, <laughs> we're working on one. So I want to. I won't put this up before we get up into it. You are a legitimately hardworking individual. I remember uh, talking with you when going through the process of getting the accreditation done. Yeah. Because that's the thing is. You hear these programs, be like, oh, "Is it accredited?" Because there yep. are programs out there. They're good schools. They're good. Yeah education but they're not accredited and there's an right. aspect why was that important for you to get the accreditation for you guys yeah accreditation validates that you are a top-notch school and that you're not a diploma mill mm -hmm. that you have the scholars in place to teach students you have mm -hmm. the right people in place and accreditation makes sure that you are meeting all those requirements and that's why even the right accreditation agency is important, right? Mm -hmm. Because now they not only have diploma mill schools, they have diploma mill accreditation agencies. So wow. schools go after these accreditation agencies that are not accredited mm -hmm. by the U.S. Department of Education. Mm -hmm. And these schools are telling students, we're accredited. And then you look at the accreditation agency and it's like, no, that's a weird accreditation. Right. So... We're accredited by one of the most rigorous accrediting agencies for Bible college and seminaries. Uh, and that is uh, the Association for Biblical Higher Education. They are accredited by the U.S. Department of Education, top-notch. Awesome. And um, so it validates you as an institution. Word. That's awesome. And I, I want to point that out for you guys, A, so you guys can check them out if you want to, but also uh, the that's the level of education you carry yourself. Like you are, this is, you're not just some, you know, throwing stuff out there guy. You're, you're passionate about the Word of God. You handle this very carefully. And the point of the show is to bring you guys kind of in-depth conversations about the Scriptures. Mm. Uh, but we want to make sure this is accessible. We don't want this to be super heady over your head and be like, man, I need that doctor from Bridges to understand this. Like, hopefully right. you guys are getting this on a, on a level that you understand that you can talk about with other people. You can talk about right. with your children, understand it. I went to Bible college because I wanted to learn about the Scriptures more. Yeah. And I needed certain tool sets. Not to, that wasn't speaking ill about my uh, about my leadership here at the church. And my, in fact, I'll tell you this: my lead pastor at the time, uh, his name uh, is Harold Bagnetto. Love him to death. That man has forgotten more about the scriptures than I will have ever learned. I mean, just wow. I remember sitting in the office with him, and he's just talking, like just talking to himself. And I'm like, 
what? <laughs> I'm just writing stuff down. It's like every every lesson was like a yeah, theology yeah. sermon, and uh, but I needed I needed the structure to grow and learn, yeah. and so I appreciate that you guys provide that for people in a very affordable place. Yeah, absolutely. So, all right, well, we're dropping in now. We're continuing. The last week we talked uh, about um, um, about leprosy being healed, guy being healed from being paralyzed, and declaration of, of almost the divinity of Jesus, kind of. Now we're getting into an interesting conversation where we're starting to see the calling of another disciple. And so let's pick up here in verse 27. After that, that being the healing of the the paralyzed man, uh, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he left everything behind and he got up and began to follow him. Now, this is an interesting situation. Levi is also known as Matthew. So uh, this is the Matthew who, uh, well, the book of Matthew, uh, he wrote that. <laughs> that, right. was, that was his book. Um, but why is this a big ordeal that he's calling this tax collector? Why is that a special situation there? Yeah, tax collectors were very much hated mm-hmm. by society, they were seen in Jewish culture as even traitorous mm. to their own culture because they were collecting taxes on behalf of the Roman Empire. Mm-hmm. So they were definitely seen, they were put in the unclean group. Right. And so this is, Luke does everything intentionally, as and of course he's inspired by the Holy Spirit to do this, right? right? This all of Scripture is inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the Lord is showing us kind of a pattern here, uh, and it, it there's a little bit of irony that happens even at the beginning of chapter 5, right? where Simon Peter, who is probably a law-following Jew, right. okay, there's nothing in the text to indicate that he wasn't, so he's probably one that follows the law pretty regularly. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you know the story. You guys, I'm sure, covered it a little while back. And so Jesus tells him to put out his nets. They catch a bunch of fish. And then what does Simon Peter say? He says, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. Right. It's a little bit of <laughs> irony there. So it shows there in Luke chapter 5 that even a, a law-abiding Jew was sinful. Then you go to the next story about the leper who was mm-hmm. unclean. Then you go to the next story about the paralytic who mm-hmm. would have been as well kind of seen as a lowly in society. And then you get to hear with the tax collector. Right. So Luke is showing us a pattern here is that God calls everybody, all kinds of people, right? right? And the Lord calls them, and it doesn't matter what background they came from. Mm -hmm. Anybody can come to Jesus. Absolutely. Um, And that's, honestly, that's one of the things I love about about Luke's very meticulous way of walking through things. Because you begin, he doesn't just go, yeah, he called this guy, he called this guy. The detail he gives us, it gives, it paints a beautiful picture of really the heart and compassion of God. Yeah. For people across, we talked about this several weeks ago, was, that is a running theme through Luke is that he shows the compassion that Jesus has for people mm-hmm. as a whole. People did not like Levi. Right. They, do, they would not have hung out with Matthew. We're about to no. see how bad this was, the situation here a second ago. I want to encourage you guys, there are people you don't like. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, there are some of you that you've been taught to not like people. Mm-hmm. That's not the heart of God. Right. Period. There yeah. are people that, Everyone needs the heart of, they all need Jesus. They all need his compassion. And he needs you to be willing to reach out to them and to show that love. So, again, it's, uh, I'm not going to get on a soapbox because I can't about that real quick. But <laughs> we got to have love for people. So Amen. Jesus calls him very, in a very rabbitic way. He just walks up and goes, follow me. And the guy's like, bet, just drops everything off. I got to wonder, because again, that was, from my understanding, that's a very rabbinic way of walking up. The rabbi walk up and you see somebody goes, I'm choosing to be a disciple, follow me. And they would go. I gotta wonder if that was the first time Levi ever heard those words, because I mean he's a Jew, so he would have right. been raised in the in the thing. I can't help but wonder if he. And this is pure speculation. Do sure. not go make a doctrine on this, guys. <laughs> All right, that's how cults start. But I have to wonder if he became a tax collector because he was never accepted by a rabbi before. Oh, we don't know. Yeah, I don't know. But and it's so, an interesting thought. Yeah, it's just one of those things I've always wondered about. Yeah. So, all right, let's continue on. Verse 29, uh, and Levi gave a big reception for him in his house, and there was a great crowd, tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. The Pharisees, their scribes began, and, uh, I'm sorry, the Pharisees and their scribes began grumbling at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? Let's pause right there real quick. So, the now repentant Levi, 
the the man who was considered the worst of the worst in society is now throwing a feast for Jesus, yeah. celebrating Jesus, who he is. And it's not filled with his fellow converts, but many of his associates who were converts or who were tax collectors also and other sinners. Right. This upsets the religious leaders who, uh, interesting enough, I find this interesting. And some translations, it reads a little bit differently, but basically it, it seems like they're not actually talking to Jesus directly. It's almost like they're subvertedly like going to his disciples like, why would you just let your, your leader do this? Yeah. Why would your 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 Lord hang out with these people? It was almost like he, they were trying to, you know, hey, disciples, maybe you shouldn't follow this Jesus type of thing. So a little dissension. Yeah. yeah absolutely. And uh, which... I, again, I got, I got, I'm not going to get a soapbox, but that's demonic, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so here's a question for you. How do we maintain balance and making sure that the world does not influence us, but keep an open door to reach those who are lost? Because that's what we see happening here yeah. is that you have Levi who, you know, again, he's saved for 10 minutes. He's like, we're having a feast. I'm bringing the cr- this crowd that I used to know over. And they're in this area. And that's the, what the, the, the Pharisees are like. Why are you hanging out with these sinners? Yeah. And again, this is not unpopular for people that get saved and there is a bounce of not being with the world, right. but also it's not to the point where we go out and build a compound and we isolate ourselves from the world. So how do we yeah. have that balance of things? Yeah, I think that obviously we need to reach sinners and so right. we're going to be around them or those that are not with Jesus and we, you know, Jesus loves sinners and so we're called to love people as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, we don't, of course, approve of sin, mm-hmm. and we should never allow it to influence us to mm-hmm. sin. I think Paul answers it well in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, uh, where he talks about how that, he, well, there in that text, there in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he's dealing with the church, and there in a very sinful culture, especially a Greco-Roman society, that there's a lot of immorality, there's a lot of temple worship, and Paul gives a scenario about meat sacrificed to idols. What do you do if you're at a unbeliever's house and they put before you meat sacrificed to idols, which was common mm-hmm. in that day because that was a part of the culture. They right. would sacrifice an animal at a pagan altar and they would eat the meat right afterwards at a little festival banquet, but whatever meat was left over would make its way to the market. So... The point is there is that the fact that Paul is talking to believers about being in an unbeliever's house and uh, one that's not a believer means right. that they were active and hanging out with unbelievers, Absolutely. right? So they were obviously sharing table fellowship with those, not in a, not in the sense that they were going to be unequally yoked mm-hmm. and influenced, but in the sense that maybe they were reaching them and so on, right? So he says there that, hey, only... Um, refuse to eat the meat if the unbeliever says this meat was sacrificed to an idol, mm-hmm. okay? And Paul says, it's not for your conscience, okay? It's for the unbeliever, the other person's conscience, mm-hmm. so that they don't kind of misconstrue mm-hmm. what Christianity is, that right. they don't get confused because Christianity was understood to be separate from the world. Right. So there are situations there where you're in that... Um, Obviously, you're there reaching people, mm-hmm. right? But he does draw a line earlier in the passage where he says, hey, but don't participate in idol feasts. And that's mm-hmm. in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Mm-hmm. And he says, hey, don't do that because the feasts there, these offerings are given to pe- these pagan gods, right. which is demonic. Right. And I'm summarizing. But... Paul does draw the line where it's like, don't cross that line. Right. Don't participate in the demonic worship itself. Correct. It meets meat, but if it's for the purpose of demonic worship, stop. <laughs> right. Exactly. So I think there there are um, there are scenarios where you have to use the wisdom of God and you have to ask a couple of questions. Number one, is this drawing me closer to the Lord or taking me further away? Mm-hmm. Uh, number two is this going to take somebody else further from the Lord or draw them closer to the Lord? Right. And the, you ask those two questions, and that's what Paul says to do in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He says, whatever I do, I do for the good of others. Right. And I think that's a good place to start mm-hmm. whenever you're reaching those in the world that, um, hey, is me being in this situation 
going to potentially draw others from the Lord? Right. Or is it an opportunity to reach people? Because Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, to him who thinks he stands, take heed lest he falls. So any one of us could fall into mm -hmm. sin. Yeah. And we, we do have to be careful, yeah. right? So I think there are some situations Christians should not be in uh, that would be unwise. Mm -hmm. So that way they don't create a situation where maybe they might cause somebody else to stumble or themselves to stumble. But that doesn't mean we don't hang out with those that are um, unbelievers right? with the purpose, of course, of reaching them or influencing them, not right. them influencing us. And I think we have to always think about those couple of questions that I brought up a moment ago. Yeah, absolutely. And again, there's a balance to it. Wisdom is the key word there. Yeah. You have to really examine the situation. Jesus is here. It doesn't say Jesus is participating in anything inappropriate. Right. Yeah. He's hanging out, eating food. You know? Yeah, exactly. Uh, years ago when I worked a uh, I worked at a, uh, a secular job and there were some people and they're like, hey, we're going to get together and do some stuff. I'm like, I'm not going to participate in that. Right. But then there were other times like, hey, we're going to go to somebody's house. We're going to you know, play video games and chill. All right, I can roll with that right. because I understand where I'm at. And I know yeah. I, this is the environment I can be in. I can be a witness to you guys. Yep. And they respect me when I said, I'm not going to go out drinking with you guys. Yeah, um, I know people who, uh, we have a ministry here locally. It goes down to the strip clubs and they minister to the girls at the strip clubs. Um, I'm not going to do that. Yeah. I'm uh, just not. I'll take part of the group that goes and helps to play bodyguard and helps to make right. sure our ladies are okay. But I know my my limits, what I can and can't do. Yeah. And that's the thing is you have to know what you can and can't handle, yep. which takes a lot of humble introspection. I think there's some people like, well, I can do it. I'm like, yeah, you're an alcoholic now, though. So, yeah, yeah. you know, pay attention to where you're at. Is yeah. it pulling you away from the Lord? Um, God never wants us to fall down because we're trying to raise somebody up. That's good. Yep. That, that's, that's the big bounce of it is. And when we're yep. reaching people, are you going down or are they coming up to where God yeah. wants them to be? Yeah. So cool stuff. All right, let's continue on. Uh, we're in verse uh, 31, I believe. Um, and Jesus answered and said to them, it is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. Uh, I have not come uh, to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So once again, Jesus is responding to complaints that weren't actually vocalized towards him directly. Uh, and he presents a, what uh, my understanding is like, it was a common proverb of the day, uh, if you will. And some have questioned if this use of, uh, of uh, righteous was a general term that he had. Uh, since scripture does teach that no one is righteous. Mm -hmm. um, he's not saying that, you know, everyone, that these people are righteous per se, but it's just the general term for it. Uh, but there's a, he's using a drum case, or is he just being sarcastic towards these Pharisees? Um, <laughs> in either case, he presents his mission to call people yeah. to repent. Um, I think that's one thing that, again, in the balance of, of, cause you, you guys are involved with missions. You've been involved with missions all your life. I know your brother leads a whole organization that does that. Yep. There is that balance of going, I'm going into things, but you can't forget the mission. Yeah. So when you are out there, when you're doing stuff, it's easy to get lost in the situation, but how do you keep the mission in the forefront of your mind of this is why I'm present Yeah. without it? Cause some people, they make it weird. They're like I'm here to, okay, yes, you are, but be a person. Yeah. <laughs> how do you keep that balance with people? Yeah. Um, and I think what you're asking here is in any type of situation, a personal situation yeah. or an outreach. Yeah. I think that is just living out being a Holy Spirit empowered believer, mm -hmm. you know, Scripture calls us to be a witness, and obviously there's a verbal witness that we share the gospel, right? right? But also to be a witness means that you are living out, you're a living testimony of the reality of what Christ has done in your life. Mm -hmm. So what that means is, is that means you're not going to lie as well. Yeah. It means you're not going to. Um, cheat on a test. I remember, you know, working for an electrical company when I was working through my undergrad Bible college. And yeah, I, I was known and as it wasn't for my glory, it was for the Lord's glory, but I was known as somebody that would not lie. I was mm -hmm. trustworthy. Right. That was a part of my testimony. Mm -hmm. So I think it's being a Holy Spirit empowered believer. Mm -hmm. That's a witness of Jesus Christ. That's walking in the fruit of the spirit. That's walking 
Holy Spirit empowered, and also sharing the gospel, of course. Mm-hmm. But being that believer that loves Jesus and loves others. Yeah, good stuff. Awesome. All right, let's continue on. Verse 33. Uh, and they said to him, the disciples of John often fast over off, off, fast and offer prayers. The disciples of the Pharisees also do the same, but yours eat and drink. And Jesus said to them, you cannot make an attendant of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them, can you? But the day will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. So the Pharisees, they're now switching their complaints from being about Jesus to his disciples to being about his disciples to Jesus. And again, it, it, it all feels very shady to me. It all feels very like, <laughs> let's just, you know, create division within this yep. group of individuals here. Um, but the, so they're, they're, they're challenging Jesus about them eating and, and their times of fasting and stuff like that. What does Jesus' statement allude to in terms of his identity and future here? Because that's a, some interesting vocabulary of the bridegroom and being taken away. What is he alluding to with this as far as who he is in relationship to this group? Yeah, here he is taking, he is talking about his eventual uh, crucifixion, well, death, burial, crucifixion, and an eventual ascension, mm-hmm. that there will be a time of fasting. That's why we fast today right? Uh, with the wisdom of the Lord. And so he's talking about that right now he's he's with them during this season of his mission. Mm-hmm. And again, it's so interesting that the teach of the law, they're not they're supposedly know the scriptures, but they're not recognizing what's happening in their midst, mm-hmm. right? And they're not recognizing the key moment in history that they're missing out on here. Mm-hmm. And so right, this is a key moment in history where Jesus has come on the scene. Scripture talks about that in the fullness of time Jesus arrived. And so this is during this special season. But eventually, of course, when he leaves and ascends, of course, eventually into heaven, mm-hmm. yeah, there's time where we've got to fast and believe for the Lord, you know. And so he's talking about that in that future season, but he's, this is like a, we call this where Jesus is inaugurating the kingdom of God mm-hmm. right there in their midst. Right. And, and they're missing out on it. <laughs> they're missing out on all of it. Right. And so, um, it's always fascinating to me. Yeah. It, on, it's, it's fascinating. It's sad to me to see this taking place. Cause it's like some of these guys are genuine. And I, I say this, some of the guys, but they're, they're genuine followers of Yahweh. Yeah. They're genuinely like, but they've allowed their traditions to harden their hearts to certain things. And here's literally the Messiah standing in front of them. Yeah. And Jesus chastises some of them uh, later because they just, they've hardened their hearts to see it. Yeah. Now there are some that they believe and we see that take place and it's, it's a glorious thing. Um, but it's sad to, that they're so stuck on certain things that they miss the bigger pictures right, right. in front of them. Um, it's really a tragic look uh, that's taking place. Uh, let's see on verse 36. And he was also telling them a parable. No one tears a piece of cloth from a new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will tear the new and take uh, a piece from the new. I'm sorry. (laughs) The piece from the new will not match the old. And no one puts the new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins and it will be uh, be spilled out. And the skins will be ruined. But the new wine must be put into fresh wine skins, and no one, after drinking old wine, wishes for new, for he says the old is good enough. There's a lot of stuff here, and and I'm pretty sure that within these four verses, there's probably 6,000 worship songs from Maranatha and Vineyard. (laughs) But what is happening here? Can you help us understand what's taking place with these parables? Yeah, Jesus is talking about the new thing that's happening right there, and He's saying that this is a new day, mm-hmm. and we need to. You don't pour this new wine into old wine skins. You don't uh, repatch uh, an old garment uh, with a new uh, cloth, a new garment, or a piece of cloth from a new garment. And um, because the old things can't contain the new, mm-hmm. it can't doesn't work together anymore. There's 
getting some things updated here. It's an update. Right. Uh, and that's what's going on here. Jesus is describing, hey, this is God is doing a new thing. Mm -hmm. And the way things were, what you guys have been walking in, this tradition, this law, those things are going to be pushed to the past now. I mean, he's inaugurating a new kingdom. Mm -hmm. And there's a new day here. Right. And and the um, Jewish leaders, again, as I mo mentioned a moment ago, they're they're missing out on it because they're stuck in that old way of doing things. Right. And they're not recognizing God is doing a new thing among us. Right. And the people that are experiencing these new things, the leper, the paralytic, Levi, right, who's mm -hmm. probably incredibly excited that he's getting <laughs> to be a part of this amazing group of empowered people right. by the by the Lord. And he says, "Hey, once, you know, People have tasted this new wine, right? Um, they, uh, you know, they they uh, they've tasted this new wine, basically, and that's kind of what he's saying here. No one, after drinking old wine, wishes for the new. For he says, the old is good enough. The people that are drinking the new wine are saying, no, the the old is past, right? right. And the religious leaders have already been still drinking that old wine, mm -hmm. the old wine of things. And because they're not accepting the new wine in right. their lives, they're sticking with the old way of doing things. <laughs> it's almost like so, my well, it's always worked. So yeah. why, 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 why change it? Why change what we're doing? Right, you know, exactly. Uh, yeah. I love my... Uh, I have some friends in my life that they, they're very stuck on some old school ways. And it's yeah. like, you know, that, that does work. Yeah. In 1962, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but some things don't work today, and right. we have to learn to grow. Now, that's not to say that Jesus, because this this can open the door for some interesting conversations. Like, well, okay, well, do we just throw out the Old Testament? Yeah, you know, because that, that that I have seen people right. try to toss out the Old Testament using this conversation. Yeah. If that's not what Jesus is saying, how do we reconcile that with the Old Testament and what the New Covenant and Old Testament covenant is? Right. Yeah, well, Paul says in Scripture, in 2 Timothy 3.16, all Scripture is mm -hmm. God-breathed, right? And, of course, the Old Testament is obviously included in that, mm -hmm. um, along with some portions of Paul's writings. They were already considering Scripture according to the New Testament. Mm -hmm. But th that um, the Old Testament is included in that, and so we need to read all of God's Word. Uh, and obviously, the Lord is doing the new thing here, mm -hmm. Right. Um, we can't make the decision as human beings what to throw out as far as God's word or that type of thing. We don't make that decision. You know? right. And God's word is not going to be thrown out. Um, so it's here Jesus is doing the new thing, uh, and we as well need to be open to God doing new things. But, of course, it's not going to contradict God's word. Right. And that's the main thing is that sometimes people will – try to add to God's word or contradict it, and that's where they get into trouble. Exactly. Yeah. I remember I had a conversation with a gentleman uh, a while back, and he was, you'll find this interesting, he was a modern-day Gnostic, and yeah. he was like, I don't believe in the writings of Paul. Mm -hmm. And he goes, Paul contradicts Jesus. I'm like, he doesn't. Right. I was like, yeah. if you read Paul's writings, they are very much in line with the teachings of Jesus. You just have yeah. to read the context. And I think that's what some people... I struggle with is they think that Jesus's words are so counter the Old Testament. It's not. He, right. they, they perfectly mirror the Old Testament. They are yeah. the fulfillment of the Old Testament. Yeah. Uh, some of it takes it up a notch on certain things, but he's not contradicting anything that has already been said in Scripture. Right. And when we see God doing a new thing today, we have to, I just want to tell people, is like, you feel like the Lord's telling you something? Go to the Scriptures. Yeah, you know, test it. Make sure, you know, you know, if you say the Lord said it, cool, rock and roll. But I mean, Again, God's not going to tell you to go sacrifice a cat in the front yard. That's just not biblical. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so measure it. And if you find it in the scriptures, some form of it, rock and roll with it. Yeah. Bless you and, and walk it out. But it's all got to line up together. Yeah. First John 4, 1 says to test the spears, see if they're from God. Exactly. Yeah. Good stuff. All right, man. Well, any last thoughts on this passage before we uh, close this up? No, I think just... Always trust God for doing new things. Word. He's a good God, yeah. Amen. All right, well, Justice, again, one more time, how can people get a hold of you? How, if they were like, hey, I want to take the next step in my in my personal walk with God, and, and I want to go to a Bible college, and yeah. I'm looking at stuff, 
how can they get a hold of you or the college and, and discover what's taking place there? Yeah, you can go to bcc.edu to check out the school. You can even apply today if you go to the Apply Now tab at the very top, or you can email us at info at bcc.edu, and we'd love to hear from you. Awesome. Well, guys, like I said all the time, let us know how we can pray with you, how we can encourage you. Reach out to us, mediahub at thbstreport.com. Check us out on Facebook. Look for Midweek Move or comment on the YouTube channel. And again, we say this every week, but we legitimately mean it. We, we want to know how we can pray with you. We don't just throw this out there. It's just not a, a, we're not just throwing information out to the wind. We're trying to help you make a move with God. And if we can walk with you on that, let us know. Until next time, have a great week. <laughs>